Hey everyone, welcome to Neil Talks. My name's Neil and it's time to talk QI. And right off the bat, I apologize if I look a little scruffy. I definitely feel a little scruffy. I'm feeling my age. Thursday night, went out for dinner and drinks with a couple of guys I haven't seen in months. Next thing you know, it's 2 a.m. and we've been we've been out for eight hours. It's now Saturday afternoon. The last 36 hours have basically been a complete write-off. I'm just too old for this stuff. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. I'm having my morning coffee. And I'm ready for some QI. <laughs> so I apologize if I'm not looking my normal polished self. In any case, I'm ready for some fun. This is from Series J. It's episode 13. It's called Jobs. Scanning the situations vacant tonight are retired civil servant Sarah Millican, <laughs> former cloakroom attendant David Mitchell, <laughs> unemployed pianist and saxophonist the Reverend Richard Cole, and ex Epping flea market sandwich board man Alan Davies. <laughs> the Reverend. Have I seen him on Would I Lie to You or a. Uh, I don't know. Vaguely familiar. I'd like to say the cloakroom I attended was for actual cloaks. It wasn't a euphemism. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it being in the 20th century, it wasn't very cloak heavy. No. <laughs> I say I actually do have a cloak. It's standard issue for clergymen. Oh, have yes, you would things. have yeah. one, wouldn't you? Has it got pockets? Yeah. It's don't... got deep poacher's pockets, so you can keep things like... Holy a bottle of wine in there if you if you Just wish in to. Case you in need case to. you happen to meet a girl who's possessed by the devil. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yes. I the of Christ both. compels you, and then the green vomit comes out. And <laughs> <laughs> which, in fact, I have done a couple. Hang on, let's just forget all the questions. Exorcisms is yeah. more interesting. Well, we don't call we call it deliverance now, rather like the right. takeaway man on the moped who comes. <laughs> deliverance, another super scary <laughs> movie from the seventies. A friend of mine who had a psychiatric unit in his parish, and there was a gentleman there who thought he was God, and would sort of follow Donald round the unit, asking him hard questions about the hypostatic union and things like that. Oh my God. And so one day Donald got a bit impatient with him and turned to him and said, look, actually, if you are God, would you kindly settle once and for all the exact nature of the relation of the three persons of the Trinity? And the man said, I never talk shop. <laughs> <laughs> What's the hypostatic union? Um, I'm obviously not a, a Bible scholar or a theologian. So, what sort of jobs are these? Sandwiches. Yep. <laughs> A ripper is a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> you might know riparian, R-I-P-A-R-I-A-N, riparian. Does that mean anything to you? It's to do with rivers? It comes from the Latin <laughs> ripa, river bank. So yeah. the riparian means of the riverside, of the river bank. Is a fish seller who sells fish. Someone's going to be someone who repairs the banks of rivers. <laughs> no, he sells fish now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. And uh, we have a willier, which comes from the same, oh, I think same profession. Is that someone who is both in the Black Eyed Peas and the Wurzels? <laughs> <laughs> oh, will I? Yeah. Will I? Are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Nice, nice, nice. I don't know the Wurzels well enough to have gotten the joke, but I, I see where it ended up. And again, we're back in the world of the loom, operating a willying machine, um, which simply yes, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Figure you might be able to work out. Uh, we don't call them a passenger, we call them a passenger. If someone uh, sends a message, we don't call them a messenger, we call them a messenger. It's a very odd English thing, adding this N. And a wharfager is someone who might do wharfage? Yeah, own a wharf. <laughs> do people That's own it. wharfs now? Star Trek, the second generation, had a character called Wharf, didn't he? He was the a next with generation. Oh, yes. And no sense mm -hmm. of humor. You surprised me with the moments when you dip into popular culture, which ones you choose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm secretly a bit of a tricky, I have oh, to yeah. say. Tapao, do you remember there's a pop group called Tapao? Really that, that, that took their name from an, an episode of Star Trek. You toured with Tapao. Well, you tend to be on the same circuit as other bands, and we used to bump into Carol Decker, who was the singer from Tapao. I'd like to see you party with Sean Ryder from... But there was no party, because actually, if you're on tour, you're so busy, everyone is in bed by ten, it's the people around. No, no. Maybe they didn't tell you about the parties. <laughs> 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 
I once stayed in a hotel in America with black grape, and it was so rowdy on the floor of the hotel. <laughs> rowdy. When I woke up, <laughs> hey, <laughs> when I woke up the next morning, and there was a bottle of extremely high quality brandy with a little note saying, "Hope you won't disturb Love, Sean." We did have a bass player who came down one morning as we were checking out and said he'd trashed his room last night. We were quite pleased because no one had ever done that in our band at all. But it turned out that actually what he did was tear up a copy of The Guardian. <laughs> 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 and we made him go and tidy it up again. <laughs> Flong maker. Yes. I have a theory that this might be a gentleman who makes foundation garments for ladies, and it's those very thin things which floss are crossed thongs. between a thong and dental floss. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually from the word printing. What the flong made was actually, it was because it was solid, the Greek for solid is stereo, and it was known as stereotyping. And oddly enough, the noise the ink made was rendered as cliché. The, the noise, cliche, cliche, noise that made when you rolled the ink. So stereotypes made clichés. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're only here to be quite interesting. We don't expect to be rolling on the floor, barking like a seal, vomiting with laughter at that thought. <laughs> no, but it's just, <laughs> that's quite interesting. You will take it home. I'm worried I'll get it wrong. To, yeah, I'm, okay. yeah, I'm planning to slightly misremember it. The, the one we can't help you with is a macaroni loper. No one seems to know. But the reason we know all these are all jobs is the 1891 UK census. People oh. had to put their profession. Because nowadays in the census, don't some people, they put that their religion is Jedi. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, as oh, a sort yes. of joke. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the macaroni lopers are having a laugh at yeah. our expense. Yeah. <laughs> It's not hard to find a Jedi these days. Star Wars will outlive all the major religions, I'm sure. Do you think? Yeah. Maybe it will. M maybe it will. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to die. Want Lee walk at the back. How does snake farming work? You plant them in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was one great snake farmer called Bill Hast, and he specialised in handling venomous snakes. And how do you think he protected himself from being bitten? Cut the heads off. <laughs> Can you sort of them. get used to it? That's the point. In fact, he got himself bitten so much, he became mm. immune. He was bitten over 120 times, 20 times almost fatally, he said. You may say, well, he was just a... <laughs> His blood was so rich... Oh. In, in anti-venom. Oh. Because there are snake handlers, of course, who are religious um, yes. uh, people in America, some of the southern states. Oh, you have to drag religion into <laughs> everything. <don't you? laughs> uh, sorry, the bishop's watching. Um, <laughs> bishop's watching. Of course, most of them die hideously of snake bites sooner or later. <laughs> but they don't seem to do There's some nasty them, snakes uh, in the American South. You might also know of a King of Pontus. Uh, Mithridates, when he was convinced he was going to be poisoned, and he was one of the first people we know of who made himself immune to poisons by taking small amounts of them. I went to India on holiday, and there was a bit of food going on, and there were some green chilies in a glass. Now, some green chilies are quite chewable and dippable. And some are so not. I could see three Indian ladies peering around the... <laughs> <background. laughs> <laughs> ..actually nudging one another. But while I was there, there was a story about an, an Indian woman who could eat she set a record that's in the Guinness Book of Records or something. I mean, yeah. dozens of these things. Yeah. Same principle, I suppose. Yeah. Have you been to Iceland? No. Oh, oh. the smelly fish. Hackerl. It's fermented what is shark. It? Hackerl is they kill a shark yeah. and then they bury it in sand on a beach so it putrefies in its own urine. And then they dig it up and they cut it into cubes and give it to tourists. <laughs> <laughs> They're supposed to feel sorry for their financial crisis. Up yours, Bjork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were they worried that tourism was going to get out of hand on that? <laughs> so, what might an inspector of nuisances do? Is it, is it, well, did nuisance used to mean something else? Was it like nuisance meaning a noise or a well, yes, Oh, a I'm, I'm going right where noise, David yes. was going there, yeah. So if it was really smelly, very noisy, they would also disinfect houses that had had smallpox. They were also responsible for the scavengers. And what were the scavengers? Today's dumpster divers? Night soil night men, soil. they used to oh. be called. They, night they soil. stole poo. No, no, no they, they bought it. The night soil man would come with his spade and he'd take your poo away. Right. Deeply necessary job, obviously. Would you and have to tip your scavenger? You know, like, you have to do, like, milkman and postman at Christmas. It's a very good question. <laughs> and you leave a Christmas the, box. You leave a Christmas <laughs> box. Especially perfect 
Yeah. Varnished stool. The best stool <laughs> yeah. you produce. I, I had you one. save it up for it. Get it bronze. Good dinner that yeah. day. <laughs> you can't spot a nut or a crack in it. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. It doesn't remain in that... St I know this because I, I was a chaplain for a bit in Uganda. It's not in its shape and form. It's slop. Slop. The same yeah. thing happens with squirty cream. Exactly. <laughs> Out a lovely yes, shape, but right. leave it for a few minutes and it's all Loose gone. It's form, it doesn't it? Thank you, David. So you just points deducted. Quickly. Points deducted for a sloppy stool. <laughs> no. I'm ready. Let's move on. Please. Now, what is it about software engineers that drives people to violence? I don't like software which anticipates needs I don't have. I've got RSI now from correcting the corrections on my phone. If I want to type the C word, and I do sometimes, yeah. Um, <laughs> it comes up with Cynthia, and that's my mother-in-law's name. <laughs> <laughs> She's lovely. It seems so unfair. Uh, Let's hope it doesn't work the other way around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going back to the very first software engineer that ever was. Babbage. The, well, Babbage Lovelace. owed an enormous debt to this person. Ada Lovelace. Uh, Ada yeah. Lovelace in, also owed a debt to this Oh. Ada Lovelace was the daughter of... Mr. Software. <laughs> <laughs> she was, like, related to Byron or something, wasn't she? No, she happened to be the daughter of Lord Byron, and she oh, was God. one of the great mathematicians of her age. And they wanted to steal the idea of a Frenchman who'd come up with the idea. It's a software idea. It was for automating something, and he invented a punch card system for it. Oh, from, from a loom. It's much more useful because it's it made for... something everybody in the world yeah. wanted to buy. Automated looms. Clothes. Punch and, cards and textiles. told what? Oh, is it for, like, a, a pattern on a cloth? Loom. Yeah. A loom. Right. A loom. Jacquard. Jacquard is the name. Oh, uh, OK. I... And so we have a portrait of Jacquard himself, which is done in woven silk using a Jacquard loom. That is done by punched cards. Cool. It Doesn't almost it? looks like a photograph. Yeah. You think that you'd is... be happier, wouldn't you? It's a, well, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> smiling in photographs is a very recent thing. It was considered weird to smile. But the question Still was, is. why did he drive people to violence? Blood Sabotage. Yeah, they the threw the wooden they did because it took so shoes into the looms. Ah, yeah. And what's the, what's the French for a wooden shoe? Sabot. Sabot. A sabot yeah. is, a, is a clog. And they would throw their clogs into the looms to break them up. And actually, Luddites in Britain were nothing like as violent. Different like, footwear, I suppose. Different footwear. <laughs> <laughs> more with a clog, yeah. can't you, than a conventional... <laughs> yeah, leather moccasin's not going to do much. When uh, the automation of the shoe trade came in, there was a bit of smashing up of machines. That's a, that's a night. If the machine's still going, they're just making ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> As they come out, chuck them back at the machine. <laughs> the Where would we be without trees? Well, so true. <laughs> <laughs> Name as many famous butlers as you can. Jeeves. Jeeves. Ah. Jeeves. Oh. <laughs> what? Why is... Jeeves was not a butler. Was he, not a butler? was he a manservant? He was a is there a difference? He was a, a gentleman's personal gentleman. Mm. Right. A butler has to be head of a household. A valet uh, is a personal attendant. Oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> is that a bit of Fry and Laurie? That so you were quite young to play the role. We were, really, yes, weren't. I was young. I mean, you in particular, because he was quite a bit older, isn't he? But as Bertie Wooster said of him, although he is not a butler, if it comes down to it, he can buttle with the best of them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, the fifth Duke of Portland uh, was so relied on his valet that when the doctor visited, the doctor would stand outside the room, the valet would do the rummaging around and call out <laughs> what he saw. <laughs> I'm just inserting my finger into his grace now. Uh, I would say it's a sort of yellowy-blue colour. <laughs> <laughs> All five of his grace's testicles are in order. <laughs> <laughs> Many years ago, I was asked, uh, as I'm sure you've been asked, to address the, the Oxford Union. I have asked me, but I always imagine that they just ask me along just so they can go... <laughs> no! <laughs> we have an entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> ask him something. Yeah, we've got... <laughs> Mark the fool. I remember this quite, even for Oxford, <laughs> astonishing young man uh, in a wing collar. And whose name was Jacob Rees-Mogg, oh, and he was the yeah. son of William Rees-Mogg, who had, for a time, been the editor oh, of he's the an Times. MP now, isn't and he? he's now an MP. He was infuriated when leafleting the streets of Central Fife, uh, but the fact that he was mocked because he was assisted by his nanny. <laughs> um, his response was, 
Well, I, I do wish you wouldn't keep going on about my nanny. If I had a valet, you'd think it was perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what use is a sheep in a gold rush? <laughs> oh, yes. the Argonauts. Be cold and lonely on Golden Fleece. <laughs> no, 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 no. The I um, was it Tim Severn who did the the analysis of the Argonaut voyage? But they used sheep fleece. They like pinned them down in the bottom of rivers that had that were known gold rivers, and the texture of the wool would shrap the gold. And so you would literally pull out golden fleeces from the river. I, that, I'm sure that's what this is about. Would you filter stuff through wool, thereby extracting the golden The wool? man is right on there the money, goes. quite literally. That's exactly goes. what you do. Indeed, there's one man who wrote a book about it. Uh, his name is Tim Severin. He um, wrote a book called The Jason Voyage. He's one of those people who believes in a lot of Greek myths. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a Thor Heyerdahl on type. Originally true stories that have become exaggerated. And he believes the Golden Fleece may be one such an example. Now, what are the Swiss planning to tidy up next? Is it in space? Yes. Oh. Well done, Alan Davis. Yeah. What's the problem in space? Too many dead uh, satellites. Old satellites. Debris. They're attempting technically to find ways of clearing up this debris, which is a, a Dyson. serious worry. You need a Dyson. Well, you need one <laughs> hell of a Dyson. <laughs> what? Dyson. Why is it? No, you need uh, you need the 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 nanny with the vacuum from uh, Spaceballs. Why the Swiss? Do you know Why what? now? <laughs> they have to... I've got a horrible thought. It, it might be for profit. Oh. oh, then I'm just a bit OCD. I don't think... The, <laughs> the Earth is surrounded by junk from old satellites and uh, all down to small pieces of wire and chips of paint, all hazardous to current satellites, on which our lives are beginning to depend. GPS and peacekeeping and all kinds of grinder. things. Grinder. Oh, yeah. grinder. Gotcha. Yeah. There's a project called Clean Space One. There they are in the snow looking... Actually, that's Telly Savalas's hideout in Honor Majesty. Yeah, Street. I was just about to say, that looks very Bond. <laughs> it, they will manoeuvre alongside the unwanted object, grapple it with a claw, there you are. Then dive into the atmosphere. The actual janitor thing is also destroyed. They both burn up in the atmosphere. So, so for every speck or needle, yeah. they have to send up a separate little Which old costs lady with a claw. Twenty-seven million pounds. Well, this well, is that's ridiculous. Really, that's what I mean by saying <laughs> that's so human. What about some sort of? I mean, I've admittedly haven't given this much thought. <laughs> <laughs> some sort of Hoover. Yes, space balls. Or you want to push them out into space, which is a bit That's loutish. A, even more literary, <laughs> frankly. It? it is, it is loutish. It's like sweeping out the front door. Now, mm. what would be the best planet in I'm the solar system that, to that take your annual holiday? Plane got shelved. Earth. Absolutely the right answer, I would yeah. frankly say. Well, um, the great advantage of Earth is that you can survive on it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so, so lovely on a holiday, isn't yeah. it? In, in many of the places. Uranus. Because it would be much longer. Ah, now there you're getting very interesting. Well, ne uh, Neptune's Uranian even longer. 84 Earth years. 84. But each day is only 17 hours. About, about 10 days. So a day on Jupiter is only about 10 hours. Oh. Jupiter is also entirely gas, which is not really very nice. It precipitates neon rather than water in the atmosphere, which creates brilliant bright red rain. It's fabulous. That would be so pretty. So, but, uh, pretty cold. So yeah. essentially, Jupiter's a nightmare. Your annual holiday, not only is it a shorter fortnight, it only happens once every ten years. Yes. <laughs> Venus, on the other hand, rotates incredibly slowly. Yeah, oh. but it's also like 900 degrees. It would last over 15 years. Oh. It's clouds of sulfuric acid. <laughs> the surface is hot enough to melt aluminium. So you need really thick flip-flops. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the atmospheric pressure is equivalent to being half a mile under the sea on Earth. Um, it's it's a bit like being in an Ibethan club at about six in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you'd only want a yeah. week there, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, it's like a, you, you, you don't go to Vegas for more than three days. You don't go to Venus no, for more than a day. I have a dubious a theory about Alice in Wonderland for you, if you're quite interested. Sure. A dubious oh. theory. Stephen Fry. How is this? <laughs> the series Jay thing? Wonderland isn't a wildly imaginative children's fantasy after all. It's a bitter, satirical attack on Victorian mathematics. Carol was a mathematician, wasn't he? Oh. We're not going to discuss it further? I like that one. I like that one a lot. Oh, maybe we are. Okay. At Oxford. Yeah. And he was a very conservative, classical mathematician. And there was a new world coming into maths that would resolve in David Hilbert's famous questions and the 
Poincaré conjecture and Riemann's hypothesis. Invention of the number themselves. nine, of course. The invention very, of the number very <laughs> controversial. Um, <laughs> I've, I've never squeeze, taken to it myself. Squeezed <laughs> it in between seven and, and, and ten, and yeah. uh, 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 eight and ten. Yeah. 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 Eight, eight came even later. Eight that, came that was later. <laughs> they needed it for the war. All that sort of absolute nonsense he thought typified modern mathematics. The cat was brilliantly played in the Tim Burton film by, by um, who did the voice of the cat? It was super. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, God. Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Minus 2,000 points. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a Johnny Jape, this time involving lasers and balloons. And I've got my laser. This is one of these uh, things they use. Laser pointer, you know, yeah. I'm going to point it. I keep shouting in my ear. Don't point it at people's eyes. I'm not. I'm <laughs> 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 fucking dangerous. <laughs> and I'm just going to press the laser here and. Oh! Whoa. And. Oh! Whoa. And. Oh! Whoa. And. But it's not going to work on the white. Green! Wow, cool! <laughs> the black ones pop and the white one doesn't. Alan, you, got, you should have. You should have a. <laughs> Take your black marker, please, oh. and can you make a black target roughly in the centre of the balloon? And I'm going to let you press the button as a reward if you do it sensibly. So... <laughs> the drawer of cock and balls. I know. <laughs> if you'd work for Blue Peter, you'd know how to do that while presenting to camera. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, there you see, exactly. We know that black absorbs light and heat, and white, we know, reflects it. Oh! Hey! Sure. <laughs> Twerk. Oh, yeah. So what was Darth Vader thinking? <laughs> <laughs> God, they put all the stormtroopers in white. Didn't help. No minus score. Ooh. Wow. Really? In first place. <laughs> in first place. <laughs> patronizing bastards. <laughs> 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 Twenty-three points 23. is Richard Cole. By the grace of God. In second place with plus 13 is David Mitchell. For someone who's very, very smart, I'm not sure David's ever actually won. Well done, sir. Because he's also very, very willing to, to take a klaxon for the team. In last place with zero is Alan Dale. <laughs> uh, he dug himself out of the hole for jeans, though, so good for him. Thank you, good night, and be excellent unto each other. Bye-bye. <laughs> I, I, I've said it before, but it's worth repeating. This this show just takes me to my happy place. This was this was great. I mean, we love Sarah Milliken. We obviously love David Mitchell, the Reverend. I feel like I've seen him on something, but I may be mistaken. I, I've seen a lot of UK panel show content over the last couple of years, and I can't keep everybody straight. But he seems familiar. But if not, he was thoroughly entertaining. But it sounds like he had a a musical career of some note as well. So you guys are going to have to fill me in and let me know what that's all about. But yeah, just a, a cool episode. I, I One of the things that I miss about the show, that they did pretty darn regularly during Steven's run, was for each series they would have like a novelty. So for series E, there was the elephant in the room. And... There, there, there were certainly other... Uh, there was, like, the Nobody Knows season. Um, and I guess this was the one of Dubious... What was it? Um, but, yeah, they, you know, they have sort of recurring segments or um, wild card sort of things that just made that series interesting and kind of unified the series only vaguely. But you know what I mean. Uh, I don't recall that they do that recently since Sandy joined. It's not heavily missed, but but I like getting these callbacks to it doing the earlier series. It was an interesting episode because I'm trying to... How to put this? There's not like a an instantly memorable moment. It was just entertaining all the way through. And I think it was also a very tangential episode. Like some episodes are very much about the theme of the episode. 
um, or center on one of the quote special guests, you know, like if Giles is on, Giles Brandreth is on board, he's going to steal the show, that sort of thing. This felt like a whichever way the wind blows kind of episode. We'll just sort of go in all sorts of random directions and it'll be entertaining and fun. But but to call this episode Jobs, it, you know, the, the, the opening segment was Jobs. You know, a bunch of, you know, what, what, what are all these weird words that are professions from the 1890s? But beyond that, you know, we just kind of went all over the place and that's cool. I'm not at all surprised that Steven is a Trek fan versus a Star Wars fan, because he was quite dismissive of Star Wars. That being said, this is 10 years ago. So this is before the sequel trilogy and certainly before all the Disney Plus shows. So, you know, the world was sort of stuck with the, the bad taste of movie Jar Jar in their mouths. But I wouldn't be surprised if Star Wars outlives... Uh, a global religion or two. Like, there aren't a lot of Zoroastrians out there anymore. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be other religions that kind of fall by the wayside in the coming century or two. But Star Wars may have the staying power of something like Shakespeare. Don't hear what I'm not saying, because I know all of you are like leaping to your keyboards right now accusing me of blasphemy or something. I'm not saying Star Wars is necessarily as good as Shakespeare. I'm saying it has the lasting power. The Bible isn't as good as Shakespeare either, but it managed to stick around. There's good stories that last, and there's mediocre stories that last, and, you know, the why isn't always because it's a great work of literature. It's often because it's just a really cool story. Especially in the age of mass media that we've been in for the last century. It'll be curious to see what what are considered like classic films 200 years from now. What do people still watch 100 years from now from the 20th century? Star Wars is going to be in there. Um, I think. I may be wrong. Debate. Discuss. That's what these comment sections are for. Uh, yeah, in any case, it was a fun episode. Thank you for recommending it to me. Thank you for keeping those recommendations coming. I'm working my way through the list. I'm not, I'm never in danger of running out, but I'm always looking for new episodes to add to it. And, um, if you're relatively new to the channel, don't be, don't be afraid to check out the, the back catalog of stuff I've already reacted to. There's, there's a ton of QI content here on Neil Talks already. Thanks for doing all the fun algorithm stuff that YouTube seems to, seems to enjoy. And until next time, everybody, take care, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Cheers.